Hi, my name is Ethan Korngold, and I'll be talking about Taver annular rupture. I built my talk around a very instructive case. It's a case that unfortunately had a terrible outcome, but it's a case that I learned a lot from, and I hope you can too. Here are my disclosures. So annular rupture in TAVR is fortunately an infrequent circumstance. It happens about 1% of all TAVR cases. It has a very high rate of mortality regardless of the treatment modality. TAVR annular rupture can be subcategorized as intraannular, subannular, superannular, or combined. So getting directly into this case, this is a 78-year-old woman with hypertension and dyslipidemia. Her echo shows an EF of 75% with peak velocity of 4.3 meters per second and a mean gradient of 44 millimeters of mercury, so clear indications for aortic valve replacement. Her cath, her cath showed no coronary artery disease. STS mortality was calculated at 2.0%, but she had two out of four frailty with grip and walk. Our heart team determined her to be intermediate risk. And importantly, the patient declined a sternotomy in case of catastrophic complication. This is something we specifically review with each patient during our multidisciplinary valve clinic. So reviewing her anatomy, she had uh, excellent femoral access from both sides. Her annulus measured 457 squared millimeters, sizing to a Sapien 3 Ultra 26 millimeter valve. You can see uh, measurements on the right. Her coronary heights were uh, slightly uh, low on the low side, but her, uh, her uh, sinuses of Valsalvo were quite large. We felt that this would be no problem. The plan was for a right transfemoral access with our standard minimalist approach. So here we are finding a coplanar view. Nothing unexpected about these initial images. And then we proceeded with alignment and deployment of a Sapien 3 Ultra Valve. We did a standard sort of high-ish deployment, about maybe 85-15 or maybe even 90-10 deployment. And immediately after deployment of the Sapien 3 Valve, patient had hemodynamic collapse and EKG changes. So our first move was to do an angiogram of the ascending aorta. You can see immediately, number one, that the cardiac output is very low, and number two, on the angiogram, you can see that there is no filling of the coronary arteries, either the right or the left coronary arteries. The echo on the right panel, surface echo, shows that there is very poor left ventricular function, and there is no pericardial effusion. So the uh, patient was hemodynamically unstable. Our first maneuver was to put in an impella CP and plan on intervening on the occluded coronary arteries. So an impella CP was placed quickly and then uh, set about wiring the left coronary artery. So this is an EBU35 guide and typically I'll approach this situation with an 035 glide wire advantage just to try to navigate through whatever is obstructing the coronaries, whether it's leaflets or the valve frame itself and then used a Navicross uh, catheter to change to a mailman wire, and then placed a Zions 35 by 15 drug looting stent at the origin of the left main coronary artery. At this point now, the left main was stented, and there is good flow in the left main coronary artery, but the patient still had refractory VF, CPR was initiated, and the plan was to go after the right coronary artery. So this is what we did uh, in between bouts of CPR. The right coronary artery was cannulated uh, using a JR4 guide and uh, stented with a 3.5 by 15 Zions drug eluting stent at the ostium. Patient stabilized briefly and we all breathed a sigh of relief, but then suddenly the patient became hypotensive again. At this point now, repeat echo showed that the patient developed a large pericardial effusion with evidence of tamponade. Uh, pericardiocentesis was performed. Uh, 800 cc's of blood were removed, which was autotransfused. And at this point, we placed a pericardial drain. With pericardial drain uh, placement, the patient briefly stabilized. Um, but at this point, we were extremely concerned about uh, what would tie together this pericardial effusion with her coronary obstruction 
uh, and uh, started to look more closely at her aorta. We did uh, quickly look at the coronary arteries again to see if there was a coronary perforation, but the coronary arteries were clear at this point. So uh, an aortogram was performed uh, just here uh, injecting, uh, actually in this case we're injecting the left coronary artery, and you can see just the barest hint of an aortic dissection. And this was repeated with a pigtail, and you can see now clear evidence of an aortic dissection on the greater curve of the aorta. Now, there was some uh, uh, ideation about using an ascending aortic stent in order to stabilize this aortic dissection, and this is something we've actually done in the past under emergent circumstances with a carotid uh, cutdown uh, in order to uh, facilitate placement of a uh, uh, a AAA iliac extender because the sheath delivery system is not long enough to go from femoral access, but because of the patient's hemodynamic instability, this is something that we did not think was feasible under these circumstances. Per the patient's explicit request before the procedure, no sternotomy was performed and uh, the patient was brought to the CCU with continued pericardial bleeding and ultimately expired with her family present. So in retrospect, looking at this case, I think the key issue is the sizing and in particular the interaction of the 26 millimeter Sapien 3 with the sinotubular junction, that that is likely what caused the aortic annular rupture and dissection. This case was very instructive for me because it illustrates several of the consequences of annular rupture, pericardial effusion and tamponade, ascending aortic dissection, coronary artery obstruction, and cardiogenic shock. So learning points for me for this case is to respect the sinotubular junction, consider undersizing and or low placement of a balloon expandable valve, or self-expanding or mechanically expanding valves. If an annular rupture or dissection are identified, the, the consequences must be managed quickly, whether it's percutaneous or open surgically. And in valve clinic, always discuss patient preferences in the case of a catastrophic complication. Thanks very much. If you have any questions, please feel free to email me at ethan.corngold.providence.org or Twitter at ekgpdx. Thank you.